The other day, the Blackmagic Camera app came out for Android, and like many of you, I was sadly disappointed because I have an older Pixel 6 Pro, and that is on the long list of unsupported Android devices. We learned that Blackmagic only released the Android version for the latest versions of the Google Pixel line and the Samsung line, but countless other top of the line flagship style phone brands were completely left out and everyone, including myself, was kind of confused. And while I firmly believe that Blackmagic has their reasons as to why they didn't just open up the compatibility list, if this is an app that you want on your Android phone, here is the way to get it, even if your phone is listed as uncompatible, because I got my Pixel 6 Pro right here and it's running the Blackmagic camera app. So firstly, I gotta give a huge shout out to Mafti Magni, Mafti Magni. There's a couple of people who commented on my video saying that they were able to sideload the APK and get it installed on whatever Android device they were using. And I respond to those people because I'm not a big Android person. Like, how does one sideload an APK? Thankfully, this is incredibly easy. So I'm actually gonna copy and paste their instructions that they gave me. It's gonna be in the description so you can check it out. All it really takes is clicking the link, searching for the app in this not app store, app store sort of environment, and you essentially find the downloadable file for the app. It's gonna ask you if you wanna install this on your phone. You say yes, and there it is. It's chilling right there. The Blackmagic camera app is working on my Pixel can confirm. So now what I wanna do is go through, compare it to my iPhone and to see what features are missing from the iOS version in version 1.0 for Android. Now keep in mind that every phone is gonna be slightly different and so I'm gonna point out where those differences will be. So of course I'll have them tagged here, but on this side we have iPhone and this side we have the Android. Now, before we move on to the next session, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, and that's Anchor, who's helping me keep all my devices charged. Today, I have another awesome multi-port Anchor charger, but this one comes with intense speed for multiple devices. Whether you're like me and you want to use it for your home office, set it up in a studio space, a workspace, or wherever the family gathers, not only will you have enough ports to charge all your devices, you can finally have a charger that doesn't slow down when you have a bunch of things plugged into it. Here's the problem. You have a bunch of devices that need charged, let's say you use another branded charger. If you're trying to charge camera batteries, phones, tablets, computers very quickly, this is an issue. So then the way you combat this is by having separate chargers, but now you have a bunch of different cables and wall blocks that need to connect to each other. Good luck traveling lightly with that. So enter the Anchor Prime 200 watt six port charger. Here you get four USB type C and two type A ports. And so you'll always have that 200 watts of max performance to pull from. For example, that means you can charge two 14 inch MacBook Pros to 50% in just 28 minutes. The reason I have loved promoting Anchor for so long is they have technology like Multi Protect and Active Shield 3.0 built into all their products. So you can have peace of mind that beyond just incredibly fast speeds, the tech is inside to protect both your devices as well as from starting any fires or anything. So if you want to see the great deal that the new 200 watt is currently going at, check the link in the description below. And huge thanks to Anchor for sponsoring this portion of the video. So here we can see a near exact copy of the interface. We have all of our same tools here up at the top. They all function the exact same. When we tap on them, we can see our various different uh, options here. The only thing that I noticed was different here was the audio on the iPhone is tappable. So we can actually go in here and adjust our monitoring levels as well as our audio source. Uh, on the Android version, there's no tapping the audio, uh, nothing happens there. Below that, again, it seems we have pretty much the same tools here. So we have our slate, we have our ability to zoom, we have image stabilization, which again, this is where I'm sure it's gonna vary depending on what your Android phone has. Uh, I actually really like that the Android one is listed as optical and standard because optical means that there's not gonna be any digital stabilization, there's no crop. Uh, and so it's just gonna be the physical optical movement of the stabilizing sensor. So I do like having that option, but again, may vary depending on your device. Of course, we have the record button in the middle. We have our exposure button right here, which I learned an interesting fact, and I think this is the same for both devices. Some of these menu items change depending on what you have locked at the top. So right now you'll notice that because I have my shutter angle locked, when I hit the exposure button, it is a quick access to change the ISO, which I really like because if you're filming vertically, 
it's kind of hard to get your thumb all the way at the top or you have to use your second hand to hit ISO up there. But if you have your shutter angle locked, you can just hit the exposure button and have quick access to your different ISO and put it down. However, if you unlock the shutter angle and hit the exposure, now you have a more traditional uh, kind of exposure EV style to plus or minus, or you can go into even uh, autofocus. We have auto and manual focus. Now the Android version does not seem to have the different focus points. So on iOS, we gained the ability to have three different markers. So if you wanna mark something as close focus, back focus, and then you can just tap those and it will kind of venture in between. That is missing from the Android version, but we can go into, of course, autofocus or just straight up manual. And then for all these, it looks like we are just missing the LUT. Yeah, so right now we're just missing the uh, LUT for on or off. And maybe that's something in the advanced settings we just have to turn on. But for now, that's what we're noticing. Then, of course, at the bottom, we have the camera, media, chat, and setting. So this all seems pretty much the same. Uh, we can log in to Blackmagic Cloud on both, and we could have clips syncing back and forth. It looks like we have pretty much all the same uh, features at the top. It just looks a little different because I'm not logged in on this one yet. Chat feature again syncs to Blackmagic Cloud. And then we jump into settings where of course this is going to be the biggest differences between them. So let's break this down section by section. We have the record at the top. This one is going to vary depending on your Android device. So right now I have two codec options, H.264 or 5. We have resolution. So again, when I was at NAB and we were testing it on the S24 Ultra, you had 8K option and multiple different resolutions. Uh, color space right now is just Rec. 709. There's no built-in log equivalent, and that's because on iOS it's taking advantage of Apple Log. I'm happy because they understand that Phone logs traditionally are fake log, like the old filmic log wasn't a real log profile. So maybe it's different. Maybe there are some Android versions that take advantage of a log profile, but I'm guessing not. So most of them are just gonna be Rec. 709. Uh, we have the same if media drops frames, but it looks like we are missing a uh, time code display, time-lapse recording, and yeah, that's it for that. When we go down to camera, we have the traditional enable vertical video, or if you turn that off, it gives you the ability to record horizontal cropped video, but holding the phone vertically. Let's see what's missing. Oh, that's unfortunate. So there is no anamorphic de-squeeze. So if you're a fan of shooting on mobile anamorphic lenses, it looks like you're gonna be missing that feature, at least on this current version of Android. But if you're a fan of DOF adapters and you wanna use real lenses, you can get the image for SLR flipped. For audio sources, we have the uh, built-in mics as kind of the default. So here we can actually pick which microphone on the phone. Uh, audio format, looks like we have a couple options here. No format options, just sample rates recorded as stereo or mono. It looks like we don't have a way to audio monitor as well or change the audio output. Now I will test to see if it supports external audio, which I'd be surprised if it doesn't. So it does automatically switch over to the wireless microphone RX. That's cool. Uh, and we still don't get any other sort of audio adjustments. Let me go back here. Can Is this tappable now? Nope, still no tapping on there. Next up we have monitoring. Let's see what's missing from here. All right, so biggest one missing, looks like there's no HDMI out. So you're not gonna be able to hook up an HDMI adapter and connect your Android phone to a monitor of any kind. Media, this is the one that I noticed at NAB was missing and I was curious if it would be added by public release. And I don't see any, the same thing over here, save clips to, this is what allows us to save to an external hard drive. If I grab a little media hub here that I use on the iPhone, guessing a setting's not gonna magically appear. It doesn't look like anything's gonna come up there. So it looks like you're not gonna be able to save to an external SSD. This may be the biggest uh, feature missing from the Android version since I think that's 
the biggest advantage to shooting on a phone nowadays is being able to still record externally to a drive. Now, this isn't shooting anything like ProRes, HQ, and Apple Log and all that stuff. So it is gonna take significantly longer to fill up even this 128 gig phone shooting an H.265. So there is that. Um, but if there are any other Android phones out there that no, none of them have ProRes. So I guess I don't even know what other codec would be larger than that on a phone to shoot. So maybe maybe it's not needed. I have 89 gigs and I can shoot almost five hours of content. So, you know, I, I take it back. Maybe it's not a huge miss not to have an SSD externally. The only thing I guess you're missing out on is maybe the workflow of being able to shoot to an external drive and quickly take it to a computer and not have to deal with the phone interface. Next up is LUTs. We have no section on Android and that's probably because you're shooting in Rec 709. So they don't wanna have like, they're not adding like a gimmicky filter. So there really is nothing to, there's no point of having a LUT if you're viewing and filming in baked in Rec 709. Uh, and then for accessories, there's nothing on Android. So no Bluetooth devices, no uh, Nucleus wireless follow focus setups. I think for the most part, we have all of the core features that you would want in a professional video app. And again, for something that's free, and if you are able to sideload the APK to get it on a wider variety of phones out there, then this is an incredible app still. This isn't a dumbed down version than what you get on iOS. It is missing some key features, definitely, uh, that I'm sure we'll see in the coming weeks. And I'm sure they're going to expand that compatibility very soon. Maybe they just wanted to test a very specific market of latest phones, make sure everything was running right in a kind of larger group uh, public setting, having it out there. But of course, I'd love to hear what you guys think about it down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. See you guys in the next video.